Hi, this is Brian Kim. I'm going to share with you this case of a patient who had a retinal detachment and subsequent silicone oil was placed. And this patient also had a secluded pupil. And I did a posterior synegulysis, placed iris hooks, tripan blue, and then performed cataract surgery. You can imagine with the silicone oil, it causes some posterior pressure on the posterior capsule and it causes posterior capsule to come forward in a more convex position. And so you'll see how I'm able to disassemble the lens and do the cataract surgery safely in spite of the silicone oil. So you can see this small and secluded pupil. You can see the irregular borders and the pigmentation around the pupillary edge and pigment on the anterior capsule. So I'm going to place my corneal mark to help me center and size my rexus and make my paracentesis incisions. And I'll make them flat to the iris plane. This helps to ensure a self-sealing incision. I'm also putting my incisions for my iris hooks, as you can see here. You can see the tiny little droplets of silicone in the anterior chamber over the pupillary edge. I don't know if you can see that on the video, but there's tiny little microscopic bubbles of oil. So I'm going to put four fairly equidistant incisions. And then I'm going to reserve a fifth incision for my subincisional iris hook here, and that's going to be through the episclera directly flat and parallel to the iris plane. I'm injecting some intracameral lidocaine and epinephrine, but I went underneath an edge of the pupil and started to bluntly dissect around it. I have a lot of incisions here, so I can take advantage of all those incisions and try to go around circumferentially and bluntly dissecting the posterior sinicae off the anterior lens capsule. This blunt dissection is, is very safe. I haven't torn the capsule in the process of trying to create that opening and removing the adhesion between the anterior capsule and the posterior sinicae. And I like these blue iris hooks. I believe they're through FCI. And as you put it in, you want to just twirl the stopper so it's pointing downward, and then you can engage the pupillary edge and then pull the stopper back. This does require a two-handed technique to do it a little bit easier the way I'm doing it. I went ahead and just put this one in, but then I realized that that's actually the iris hook for my paracentesis on my chopper incision. So I just left it there for now and I'm going ahead with the iris hook on a different position. It helps actually to put the iris hooks in the area where the hook has already been lifted and incarcerated because if you go around and follow each hook it lifts up the iris a little bit so you want to go after the hook just adjacent to where you placed your other hook so you see i moved that other hook and placed it in a different position i'm putting my intracameral air and then my tripan blue and the tripan blue i'm trying to paint on the surface of the anterior lens capsule Again, I'm trying to avoid as much of an overfill of the tripan protecting the endothelium, and the bubble does help tamponade the dye onto the anterior lens capsule. I'm going to inject my dispersive viscoelastic going across the incision and then pushing the bubble out of the way. I make my triplanar corneal incision. I make a vertical groove, and I go into the groove, tunnel through the cornea, and then dive down. Now I'm going to use my, I'm going to go ahead and place my last iris hook through that scleral incision. You can see it's not long enough, so I'm going to have to pull the stopper back a little bit. And then you can engage the pupil much more easily. I'm going to use a cystitome now here to make my puncture. These eyes that have been through a lot of inflammation, manipulation, surgery, I'm convinced that they have quite a bit of zonulopathy. So I like to go ahead and we're using a cystitome in this situation. And I switch to my forceps. And I'm trying to follow the marks that I made which will help me to center and size the rexus. I'm going to 
regrab. And because the iris is so distorted, it really is hard to determine and decipher the diameter of the rexus. And so that's why the corneal mark is quite helpful in this situation. All right, so I'm going to go towards the capsular fornix hydrodissection technique. I place the cannula out to the contralateral equator, turn it down into the capsular fornix, get a nice wave, I'm decompressing on the left side. I'm freeing up the anterior capsular rim from the lens, first on the left and then the right side. Again, I have a healthy respect for the zonules in these situations. Again, previous surgery, clearly there's been inflammation with the posterior sinicae. These zonules, I just don't trust. And so I'm being very ginger, not trying to create too much force on the lens capsule as I do this. And so I'm gonna go and switch to the FACO, lift the incision with the irrigation off to minimize decimase trauma. And then I'm gonna remove the surface epinuclear material. And this will allow me to create an epinuclear ridge, which is my landmark to go under, out into the capsular fornix and equator, turn the FACO tip vertically, subincisionally, and I'm able to crush the lens completely in half. This is a double chop. I place the chopper out to the contralateral equator, pull it towards the FACO tip centrally, and this crushes the right hemineucleus, and that's the cross chop maneuver. I keep the chopper out in the equator, and then I crush it against the FACO tip to crush that first quadrant, I'm switching to the dense cataract mode, which has a little bit of longitudinal energy in it. This increases the emulsification efficiency. So again, I'm crushing the lens material with the chopper against the phaco tip, and the first quadrant is gone. Do another cross chop maneuver, place the chopper to the equator, crushing it against the phaco tip, and that begins to divide the second quadrant. I decide to rotate the lens in front of me and then I'm tackling that second part of the second quadrant there. So I'm crushing it between the chopper and the fecal tip and then slowly emulsifying the lens. And then I'm attacking the second hemineucleus, placing chopper out to the equator, placing the fica tip deep, crushing that lens completely, and dividing the lens into a third and fourth quadrant. I'm placing the chopper out to the equator again and crushing that third quadrant in half and emulsifying. Again, using high vacuum and some bursts of ultrasonic energy. going after that third quadrant gently, using a little bit of vacuum to position the lens on the tip, and then crushing the lens with the chopper. Going after the fourth quadrant, again, placing the chopper around the lens material, crushing it against the phaco tip. So I'm beginning to remove the epinuclear material, going up to the anterior rim of the epinuclear material, and you can see it starts to come forward. I like to use the chopper to help loosen up the epinuclear material and pull it out of the bag. As I remove the epinuclear material, you can see I'm placing the chopper deep in the bag, making sure that posterior capsule doesn't come forward. This is particularly important, especially with the silicone oil pushing the posterior capsule upward. I push BSS into the eye, take the fake tip out and switch to the INA. I'm trying to maintain some level of chamber stability. And then I begin the INA. I'm removing the cortical material. You can see it's a fairly clean bag, but there's quite a bit of fibrosis of the capsular bag. Again, which is not uncommon in these eyes, post vitrectomized, post retinal detachment with silicone oil in the eye.
I started to pulse some BSS into the sub-incisional capsular fornix. It was fairly clean. I'm injecting some cohesive viscoelastic into the bag, and then I'm starting to sweep underneath the anterior capsular rim, starting on the left side, and then I'm switching to the right side. Again, this is a fairly clean bag, but the bag has quite a bit of adherent uh, fibrosis, and so I don't like to perseverate and try to go after that in this context. Once I'm done sweeping, I'm going to go ahead and put the single piece acrylic lens into the capsular bag. Because I still have the hooks in, I'm going to use the sweep to reposition the haptics. And so you can see I try to use as few instruments as possible whenever I do cataract surgery. And so since I had the sweep already, I'll go ahead and use a sweep to help separate the haptics from the optic. And that's the key to your efficiency is try not to use as many instruments as possible. Going in and out, in and out unnecessarily when you can use the same instruments is more efficient. So I'm disengaging each iris hook, grabbing the stopper, grabbing the proximal part of the hook, pulling the stopper back, twirling the hook using the stopper so it disengages the pupil and then you pull it out. So again, you wanna grasp the stopper, grasp the proximal part of the hook, pull the stopper back, twirl the hook, it disengages the pupil and then you pull it out. So now it's the INA removing the viscoelastic material. I'm going to go underneath the lens. You can see the haptics are oriented perpendicular to my INA handpiece, and this ensures that both haptics are completely in the bag. I remove all the viscoelastic in the bag. I have a little bit of a lens fragment on my tip. You can see I'm just using the high vacuum to try to evacuate it. It's pretty stubborn, must be a pretty dense piece. I'm going to use the cannula to mash it and it goes out. So we go ahead and remove the viscoelastic from the anterior chamber and then I hydrate my incisions. So you can see this eye has silicone oil. You can see the sparkling of the oil beyond the posterior capsule here. It causes the posterior capsule to become convex and come forward. Again, I'm using a lot of mechanical fracturing techniques, double chop, cross chop. By minimizing the use of ultrasonic energy, I'm able to do the lens disassembly with mechanical fracturing forces. And then using just sparing amounts of ultrasonic energy, placing the chopper deep in the bag, protecting the bag as I do that. And being very careful with intermittent bursts of energy, making sure I'm protecting the bag, making sure there's enough lens material between me and the posterior capsule. And then when I'm on the last pieces, the last quadrant, making sure I have a significant or enough buffer between the phago tip and the posterior capsule. These are all basic fundamental principles of doing very safe surgery in a challenging situation. You can see that little silicone oil I was able to remove. It's a cute little bubble there. And so you can see this case was fairly routine. Uh, I like to use iris hooks because in these cases, again, zonulopathy can be associated with a floppy iris. And so I'd rather have security of the hook against a scleral wall rather than using a ring in this context. And I've removed many posterior stenicheae and secluded pupillary membranes and using the cannula on BSS or viscoelastic. And I've never caused a anterior capsular tear doing this. And so my encouragement is to go ahead and do that technique with confidence because uh, and you have to find one area where there's some loose adhesions between the iris and the capsule and you get into that spot and then you can just go ahead and start opening it up. And remember when you have silicone oil, the posterior capsule comes forward, always place a second instrument between you and the posterior capsule whenever you're doing FACO to protect the posterior capsule.
So I hope this was helpful to you, and I thank you for your attention.